we are live on uh, facebook now uh, dr ashish you can take over ye facebook ka uh, can just, you send the facebook link then just send and just hold on for a second i just lost the link there. yeah <clears throat> Dr. Ashish, you are there? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. I welcome everyone to the late night retina episode six. So, just some time back, there was some uh, technical problems and that meeting was hacked. So, I request uh, the viewers to post their questions on the YouTube uh, live link. And we will problems and that meeting was hacked. So, I request uh, the viewers to. hello <clears throat> so we will be discussing two cases today first case is uh, of optic disc bed maculopathy and the second case would be of an epiretinal membrane today we have with us uh, a three panelists uh, dr sharit thigre who is working as a consultant at prasad netralaya in udipi we have dr divyansh mishra who is a consultant at shankara eye hospital in bangalore we have dr bhavik panchal who is a consultant at lbpi in visakhapatnam as presenters we have dr surendra pal who is a vr fellow at shankara eye hospital in bangalore he'll be discussing a case on optic disc bed maculopathy and dr chavir singh who is a consultant at matashree netralaya in bhopal will be presenting a case of epiretinal membrane so i request dr surendra pal to share his screen and start the discussion on the case of optic disc bed maculopathy yes. so can you enable screen sharing sir uh, dr surendra can you wait for a minute let uh, some more people join in so give, give us okay, some, sure, some couple of minutes you can start sure, hold on to your first page we will we will start by after 2 3 minutes or something I think you can start now, Doctor Sir. Okay. So good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank my mentors, Doctor Mahesh Anmugam Sir, Doctor Divyan Sir, and Doctor Rajesh Sir. I would like to thank organizers of our late night webinar for giving me this opportunity. I am presenting a case titled "A Relapse in Double Trouble." So here we have a 37-year-old female who is presenting complaints for stimulation of vision in her left eye. the past 2 months her right eye was absolutely normal and the segment finding of left eye was normal so i am sharing the past photos of the patient so this is a left eye fundus picture at the time of first presentation so here we can see this inner retinal detachment which is present nasally and inferiorly 
This is an OCT picture showing subretinal fluid with its connection to the optic disc. At this point, they diagnosed it as an optic disc pit associated maculopathy and they performed first sitting of laser photoregulation around the disc. This is an OCT picture taken one month post first sitting of laser. So here we can see the subretinal fluid present both temporally as well as nasally. Nasally we can see the intraretinal fluid as well. They did an FFA and at late phases the hyperfluorescent points were seen nasally suggestive of leakage. At this point they did second sitting of laser photocoagulation. After first sitting of laser photocoagulation, they presented at our hospital that is Shankar Eye Hospital Bangalore with a vision of 6 by 9. If you see uh, closely, we can see the double optic display present, one at the temporal side and one in the nasal side. We can see the laser marks around the optic disc, the detachment at the medulla as well as nasally and inferiorly. So this was the OCT picture before second sitting of laser. And this is the present uh, OCT picture that is after second sitting of laser. So we can clearly see that the subretinal fluid has decreased and patient also noted that there was improvement in her vision. So we decided to observe. She actually presented to us four weeks later with decrease in the vision from 6 by 9 to 6 by 24. And we can see the serious macular, serious macular detachment has increased at the macula as well as nasally. Which, which was seen on OCT as well. So this is the present uh, picture that is five weeks after second sitting of laser. And this was like one week uh, after second sitting of laser. So we can clearly see that the subretinal fluid uh, was increased. We did an FFA. We can see that uh, uh, temporarily there was lightning in the laser marks, which uh, temporarily as well as nasally. And again, like uh, hyperfluorescent spots were seen nasally, suggestive of leakage. We did an uh, ultrasound and there was a suspicion of orbital cyst present. At this point, we uh, advise surgery for the patient, but patient opted for uh, laser. So first setting of laser photocoagulation was performed. So this was the OCT picture before third setting of laser. And this was a OCT picture one week after third setting of laser. So we can see that the subretinal fluid has in, uh, decreased tremendously. And the vision also improved from 6 by 24 to 6 by 12 parts. But after that, she was lost to follow up for about 7 months. And after 7 months, she presented to us with a decrease in the vision from 6 by 12 parts to 6 by 60. And we can see the recurrence of uh, subretinal fluid both temporarily as well as nasally. At this point, we decided to intervene. So, pars planar vitrectomy plus BBG assisted island peeling. ILM stuffing to the optic disc pit, drainage retinotomy, uterine exchange, endolaser, and 14% C3 effect gas was performed. So this is a short surgical video of the same. So, Surendra, uh, just to intervene, you can stop your video Sorry. because your, your, your audio quality is very low. Probably the internet connection is not good. So you can stop your video so that the quality improves. Okay. So video is already stops. I'm not trying. The only audio is on. Fine, go ahead. Yes. Excuse me. So this is a short surgical video of the same. After a complete pass the vitrectomy, the item was stained with BBG. And I can see that I can see the of water phobia. Dr. Surin, I am sorry to interrupt. Your video is kind of slow. The internet connection is slow. You can stop sharing the video. It's not, uh, we can have it later. I think you can go back to your uh, only screen sharing. That would be fine. I think we can do that.
Yeah, uh, yeah. Should I continue, sir? Yeah, I think you can skip the video. Uh, there is some hindrance there. You can just uh, take uh, talk from the slides only. You can uh, move to the next slide now. Okay. So this is a fitness feature. Uh, one one post operatively. Uh, her vision at uh, one one post op time was three by sixty. Which, which can be correlated to the presence of C3F8 gas in the eye. Here we can see the, C3, uh, the island flap, and this is a raster scan taken from this green line. And this can be seen in the island which is This is a two months post op uh, picture. So, on OCD, we can clearly see that the photo is completely dry. And her vision is 618, which can be correlated to the dense PSC which is present. But here you can see the recurrence of sub retinal So, my question to the panelists are uh, what can be the next step of management for recurrent SRF? What would have been done differently in this case? And what is the role of orbit imaging to rule out orbital system? Thank you. Hello. So thank you for uh, presenting that case, Dr. Surendra. Thank you, sir. A very well-managed case of optic disparate uh, maculopathy. But um, yeah, I would like to direct the first question to Dr. Sharath. As in this case, uh, what would be your uh, next line of management in a case of uh, recurrent SRF with an OD pit maculopathy as it was shown in this case? Uh, thanks, uh, Ashish. It's a very well presented and very 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 rare case to be seen. Double disc optic pit, which is also very rarely seen, and a very well managed case. Congrats to the presenter and also the who is operated the case. So you know the uh, the chances of recurrence of SRF in the optic disc pit is common, and they have done the maximum possible what all the possible things to be done. The laser, the surgery, also very nicely done. They have unplugged the inverted peel uh, and they put the ILM also into the optic disc pit. And even if the fluid is recurring, that time we need to see the complaints of the patient and whether we need to see the fluid is connecting to the pit or not. In this OCT, what they're showing, the fluid is not connected to the pit and the patient is symptomatically better, we can observe. And if it is increasing, then uh, theoretically many studies shows that they can, we can use partial thickness clearal plug to the optic disc pit or uh, amniotic membrane graft or autologous fibrin. And even some, uh, one of the studies also showed using macular buckle. So they said the macular buckle can uh, decrease the recurrence because it may it will elevate the macular surface so that the fluid won't come over the foveal area. And also they say if the fluid is coming from the uh, uh, arachnoid fluid, then it collapses the lumen of the canal and uh, it does not allow the fluid to come back into the subretinal area. So it's a very well managed case. Right now, I think we can observe this. And if it is increasing, then again, go for uh, go inside and plug with scleral plug or autologous fibrin and long-term tamponade can be done. Yes, so also studies have shown that that fluid might take about six to 12 months time to be completely yeah. absorbed. So that's yeah. like parafoveal uh, area fluid, which is there. So uh, we could observe that. Another option would be to give uh, oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Even that may be tried for a short period of time in case it is fovea involving or uh, all other measures have been tried. So Dr. Sharath, would you have uh, managed uh, differently in any way? If, uh, oh, uh, uh, this is the, I think I will be following the same way what the Dr. Evans has done. So I'm going, uh, I, I only thing is like, I may not be doing that much of laser, like where I can able to see like a thick uh, laser marks and all. I usually give it light burns. And if it is recurring, I will directly go for a surgery, however the defense has done the surgery. Okay. Next question I would like to ask uh, Dr. Divyansh. 
as to the role of laser as it was performed twice in the case which was discussed so uh, in what case selection what would be the indications where lasers would work or so uh, thank you ashish so yeah so in this case the twice the laser was uh, done outside and uh, still we saw a recurrence so as we know that optical split has this uncanny uh, uh, phenomenon of waxing and waning where we see this fluid coming and going when to intervene is again a question because when it presented to us the third time means after the second laser as you could see uh, on the first visit uh, if surender we can go to that uh, ocd the first pre the, the presentation when uh, uh, the patient had presented after the second laser so in that we can see that it is collapsing by itself uh, that that's a good sign so in that case we could have uh, observed but again uh, uh, two or three months later the patient again presented with drop in vision and again there was a fluid so we thought whether there is any other cause of leakage because we need to rule out other causes like it can have a csr also so we need to rule out that so that was that's the reason why we did an ffa to identify if there is any additional leakage but yes uh, there was no uh, additional leakage except on the nasal side of the disc where uh, the leaky uh, or or i would say the the larger part of the uh, nasal because as you know this is having a double uh, optic disc fit one nasally and one in the papillomacular bundle or temporally so laser in cases where as you can see in an autofluorescence image that uh, the laser has some intervening areas of normal retina so i i wanted to cover that area so that's the only reason we had discussed uh, with the patient regarding the surgery and the option for gas but uh, considering that she already had two times laser and it had improved so after discussing with the patient regarding pros and cons so both laser and the surgery she opted for laser so ideally surgery would have been the best option at that point but uh, finally we have to discuss with the patient regarding the pros and cons for both Okay, Doctor uh, Devansh, there are few questions on uh, YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. Have been related to the surgical techniques. So they have asked how much area of the ILM was peeled, mm -hmm. how much nasally. So nasally, I didn't peel the ILM because uh, the nasal area fit. Uh, uh, I I didn't think that uh, because what I thought was uh, stuffing the ILM from the papillomacular bundle onto the the nasal part, which is much more leaky. or much larger uh, uh, area of uh, optic disc fit which was there and so uh, uh, in the video i think we missed on to it that i didn't stuff the uh, the temporal part of the optic uh, optic disc fit the, the pit which is on the temporal side i stuffed onto the nasal side and i didn't peel the ilm on the nasal side yeah. and uh, is there any role of using a fibrin glue in uh, such cases so there are many studies regarding many things which can be stuffed it's like a dumping yard so the the biggest problem in these cases an optic nerve they can have migration if if because we know that uh, the migration possibility is always there because there is a uh, one of the theory of connection of uh, optic disc fit with the csf so we have to be careful i do not have any personal experience with fibrin glue but yes there are papers or some case reports about that and the success of vitrectomy itself in a meta analysis uh, the estimated range from 50 to 96% so it's it's really difficult you can stuff anything whatever is available in our armentary yeah so on the same line i would like to ask uh, dr bhavik as to what all uh, different materials uh, you know have been used in to seal an optic disc and what are the factors affecting the outcome yeah thank you ashish and thank you surender as well for the wonderful case um so before i go on to the question from ashish uh, just a few comment about the mechanism of so the mechanism of pathogenesis of optic disc fit maculopathy is not fully understood okay like how it happens the same appears for the fluid as well like from where the fluid comes in whether it's vitreous it's blood or a csf and still uh, debatable so what uh, is what is known from the oct analysis and what linkoff had published as well is how the progression happens so first fluid from the optic disc fit creates a schistous like inner retinal separation which happens 
and this is clinically associated with mild centrocephalus cotoma which not all the patients will be able to elucidate and then eventually if the patients come to us at a later stage and outer layer macular hole develops beneath the inner layer okay so this is associated associated with the dense scotoma so this is when the patient feels that there's something wrong and they come to us okay so the why this is important is that uh, this configuration is important in terms of visual outcome so there are reports of, uh, about apart from various meta analysis and studies that when you operate early when in the stage when there is only subretinal fluid you have a better outcome as compared to when you operate when there is schisis and an outer layer outer macular hole formation also in terms of speaking about ilm peeling versus no ilm peeling uh, studies have found that ilm peeling versus no ilm peeling uh, does not have much of a variation or, or uh, on the visual gain or the results but one paper uh, which had quite a lot of statistical significance in terms of uh, ilm peeling helped in cases where there was schisis present and whereas uh, if there is only srf present we need not peel the ilm so that was the consensus in that paper so apart from that uh, the various substances as already mentioned is autologous platelets autologous uh, serum which is present fibrin glue amniotic membrane uh, you have uh, the ilm itself uh, autologous sclera which is used even the posterior capsule if you are performing a cataract surgery along with it the capsule posterior capsule also is dumped into it uh, one rare instance i have seen in one of the videos in our conferences the punctal plug also was inserted into the disc pit by a pakistani surgeon that was quite rare and unusual which i had seen so yeah here you go for the answer um i would like to ask uh, dr devyansh there is a question by uh, dr shaswat uh, bhera he has asked if uh, this nasal side hyperfluorescence could be pooling due to the neurosensory detachment any thoughts on that Okay, so it's a little difficult because uh, all the papers, uh, if we read, uh, none of the papers have described any FFA features of optic disc pit. So in this case, uh, the same thing I had discussed with my mentor also that why we are seeing this kind of leakage and the neurosensory detachment is much more uh, in the periphery as compared to uh, means as we could see that it's a bullous kind of a detachment in the nasal and the inferior nasal cortex as compared to the area near the disc, but it's leaking from or adjacent to the disc margin from so i'm i'm not sure from where it is leaking and why only that area is leaking and why not the area which is on the temporal side or on the papillary macular bundle but we can see the fluid has extended over there so my thought process is that there is a communication of an active uh, cyst which is there in the retroorbital space which is causing an active production of csf which is pushed into the uh, subretinal space through the uh, through the optic disc or probably paradiscal uh, area which is causing this kind of leakage so i'm not sure whether uh, the leakage is because of the neurosensory detachment it is if it's like that then it has to be on the temporal and in the other areas but it is more closer to the uh, and as we can see the hyperfluorescence is more more closer to the area where the nasal disc pit is there so it's not been described this is my uh, hypothesis about okay uh, there is another question by uh, dr aman khanna he is asking uh, the type of laser which was used in this case red or green laser so ideally it has to be I mean, if preferably if we have an option of availability of red uh, so that would be better because that has more uh, or probably uh, it affects more outer retinal uh, layers as compared to the inner retinal layers and nfl and other layers are spared other they there are uh, studies for uh, not direct comparison but studies for micro pulse laser also which they have done in this cases but i'm really not sure whether micro pulse would work in this pathology considering green laser i had utilized because the the third barrage which i did uh, the first two i don't know which laser it was used probably it would be green i had used a yellow uh, uh, iridex laser uh, which we had so But still, it recurred, and then intraoperatively, I had used green. So, uh, can I ask a question to the panelists? Uh, is it Bhavik here, or to the moderators? Here? Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Bhavik. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, while going through literature, there is this apart from macular buckle, which we know that has a very high success rate. However, 
it was only from one group where they showed that their success was higher because surgical technique is uh, another surgery is the uh, is the inner retinal fenestration which is described in 2014 by Otto et al so any comments on that where you make a nick in the inner retina temporal to the optic disc bit so the idea is whatever fluid comes in through any of the communication it just goes into the vitreous and does not form a schist the meta analysis uh, by shankar netrale and it all group so I, i was just reading up that so in that they have included that but uh, the success rate is uh, as i told you it the variation is tremendous it ranges from 50 to 90% so i'm just trying to see if if anybody else can discuss anything i just uh, find out the sub sub group analysis for the optic nerve fenestration part of it as what uh, dr bhavik has asked and i just replied to it Yeah, so just to add a point here that it is important uh, apart from the, uh, the surgical management or the laser to counsel the patient in a way that this is a recurring process and a waxing and veining may happen and it is important that even after several years the fluid can come back and uh, the more the recurrence and uh, the more the surgical uh, as like multiple procedures the outcomes will be uh, further deteriorating this has to be it is important for the patient to be counseled So, Dr. Sharad and Dr. Ashish, any other points? Yeah. Uh, one of the point is I can say that most of the times what we see in the optic district is macular stasis along with the serous detachment. We see serous detachment, but also macular stasis is more common because maybe of the late presentation of the uh, symptoms and all. So, when you see a macular stasis, most of the times we have to be careful by doing the ILM peel. There is a high chance of making a lamellar hole or a macular hole. hello so yeah that was very uh, well summarized so if there would, are no questions yeah um, i would like to get on yeah go ahead yeah so regarding uh, that uh, partial thickness spreading to me which we uh, like uh, the point was mentioned so there was a, a series by otto et al so the success rate was uh, equivalent to ilm peeling and gas tamponade but uh, there was they have found that there was a premature closure of such fenestrations as well okay so thank you for uh, adding that point i think now we can uh, move on to the second case of uh, epiretinal membrane this would be presented by dr shavir singh uh, i request you to uh, kindly uh, share your screen yeah i just do that ashish just to answer to bavik's question i think they they haven't mentioned regarding the subgroup analysis for the uh, retinal fenestration but the visual acuity what they have provided is 0.07 which is not not significant as compared to the other study so this is a meta analysis uh, by one of the shankar netrale at all group so would you be doing that surgery <laughs> 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 yes, <sir. laughs> okay, i would fine. observe presently <laughs> let's go okay fine message. no problem yeah. yeah okay thank you so i'll go ahead with my case uh, i'll be presenting my case uh, on epiretinal membrane peeling so this was a case of 68 year old female uh, who came with chief complaints of diminution of vision in left eye since one year along with metamorphopsia on ocular examination her best corrected visual acuity was 66 in the right eye and 3 by 60 in the left eye the ampullary grid revealed marked metamorphopsia in the left eye the fundus photography was normal in the right eye while in the left eye you can see the epiretinal membrane over the macular area with dragging of vessels the angiography was done which revealed uh, which didn't reveal any underlying pathology and the vessels were seen over the area over the macular area which were dragged the oct was normal in the right eye and it revealed stage 4 erm in the left eye with following features absence of foveal pit disrupted retinal layers presence of ectopic inner foveal layers and globally adhered erm over the macular area 
So this is the picture. This is OCT picture pre-op where we could see all the findings of stage four ERM. The patient underwent standard three port pass pena vitrectomy using the constellation system. A core and peripheral vitrectomy was performed and the induction of complete PVD was carried out by aspiration. The BBG dye was injected through a cannula and then washed out in the fluid filled dye. Peeling was completed with help of fine tip forceps. After checking the peripheral retina of visceral indentation, fluid air and gas exchange was done. Six weeks after surgery, patient vision improved to 636, however, with paracentral scotomas. On evaluation on fundus photography and OCT, macular area was free from ERM, but pigmentation was seen over the posterior pole corresponding to peeled area. Now, this is the post-op fundus photography picture. We could see the pigmentary alteration, which was seen over the posterior pole, and it corresponded to the peeled area. The OCT, post-op OCT revealed absence of epithelial membrane with indistinct foveal contour, hyperreflective deposits over the outer retina and retinal pigment epithelium, and intermittent disruption of external limiting membrane and ellipsoid zone with back scattering. This is the OCT picture of post-op. In autofluorescence, the stippled area of hypo and hyperfluorescence was observed over the peeled area. Now, my points to the panelists are, the procedure involved uneventful surgery with pass plana vitrectomy and epiretinal membrane removal. Now, since this was a stage four ERM, was ERM so tightly adhered, like the peeling caused damage to the Muller cells and it caused related ELM disruption along with ellipsoid zone disruption or the BBG dye, which was used to stain the membrane, it has been known, it has good morphological and function results. Was it whiter dye induced toxicity or this change was due to direct light phototoxicity? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chavi, for uh, presenting this case. Uh, I would like to ask the first question to Dr. Sharath as to uh, just in general, a case of epiretinal membrane. So what would be your preference to operate on such patient? Like what would be the vision criteria or the extent of metamorphopsia based on other associated uh, comorbidities, for example, age or glaucoma. So what all uh, things would you consider? approaching a case of ERM. Hello, uh, Dr. Sharad. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, huh. now you are okay. Very well uh, managed case by Chavir. It's a very good and great uh, presentation, a great complication to be seen. Uh, so when to operate an ERM? I say, uh, like it depends on various features and various symptoms what the patient have. And it also depends whether it's an idiopathic ERM or is it a secondary ERM, secondary to any BRBO, post laser or any diabetic cases. So just like discuss about an idiopathic ERM. So most of the times I will take the patient symptoms and the visual acuity. So I usually operate if the patient vision is less than 618, or some people will take it as 6 by 12 also. And if the patient has significant metamorphopsia, so that time usually I consider the op uh, operating and peeling the epiretinal membrane. And also uh, we have to see the patient age and what is their vision requirement. If the patient is above 75, 80 years, who is not illiterate and then there is no need to go and peel the epiretinal membrane so immediately or until the patient is comfortable. And next, also check for the glaucoma. If the patient has a glaucoma that's advanced cupping, so that you have to see what is the cause for the decreased vision. Is it a glaucoma which is causing the decreased vision or is it an epiretinal membrane which is causing the significant trouble? Because uh, once you do a vitrectomy in the patient of advanced cupping, there is a high chance of progression of the glaucoma. So, most of the time, the patient also will have, have a cataract so because they are the old age people. So usually I combine the cataract surgery along with the vitrectomy and the ERM peeling together. 
and the patient have a minimal cataract because uh, you know one of the complication of a vitrectomy is they develop cataract more faster and if the patient is secondary ERM or like uh, with, along with diabetic or a PR view I usually peel earlier so in my consensus you should take care of the most common thing you should take care of the symptoms of the patient if the patient is having significant symptoms of metamorphosis and decrease in vision go ahead with the surgery Okay, uh, thank you for sharing that point. Uh, next question I would like to ask uh, Dr. Devyansh as to, uh, for example, in this case, was there a role of any uh, BBG dye toxicity or in general, how to reduce the risk of uh, having a dye toxicity uh, intraoperatively and how to manage? Uh, Dr. There are multiple questions probably we take step by step. So. Uh, there are studies in which they have identified the, uh, the percentage of the dye uh, in this case, uh, because most of us would be using the same being in India, and there is a much lesser percentage which is available in US and UK, uh, 0 0.025. Uh, so th there are studies from uh, in, in which they've identified various concentration of dyes from various exposures of time duration intraocularly and complications. in. in, in I mean, in a, not in a human eye, but uh, probably in animal eyes. But what they have identified is uh, the cutoff point is uh, that if the concentration is more than 0.5, then any uh, exposure for more than three minutes itself can cause uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, toxicity to the RP without even migrating in the subretinal space. And if the concentration is less than or uh, 0.5 uh, as what we are discussing, the maximum duration, uh, which is uh, which till which we can expect the toxicity would not occur is half an hour or maximum 45 minutes. Beyond that, even the same concentration of the dye, which we are using a 0.5 or 0.025 can also cause uh, uh, toxicities. So that's why the duration of the surgery is also important. and the concentration of the dye is also important. Yes, in cases like uh, myopic macular degenerations or maculopathy where uh, we need to peel ILM and in a sub, uh, we, we do it under partial air fluid exchange or near complete air fluid exchange so that the contact time is more. But the care should be taken that the contact time should not exceed more than three or four times where the concentration is very high. Uh, one more thing is shaking the vial before uh, taking the uh, dye because there can be a coagulum or uh, probably a thick and thin part probably because we have kept it for a very long time. So again, in that case, the, the concentration may vary so that we may not be uh, uh, seeing, but the assistant nurse should be seeing that, that whenever they are taking the dye to shake well before you so that it equally spreads within the vial and then you aspirate it and then use it. Uh, Intraoperatively, again, uh, as Dr. Shabir has used probably a soft tip cannula to decrease the jet trauma which occurs. But yes, not only that, uh, the jet trauma can occur because of how fast we are injecting. So a pulse method would be much better rather than a single jet method. Again, using the 1cc versus 2cc, a glass syringe versus uh, a, a plastic syringe, there are multiple things, but most of us would use probably a 1cc syringe so that the jet, the whatever jet is coming out is not uh, very harsh and the jet itself are known to cause micro trauma or micro damage from where it may have uh, uh, got access into the subretinal space. So this is half part of it. Then the other part is the light. So we think whatever light we are using is safe and because once it is provided by the company, it is safe, but there are multiple studies, multiple even uh, Dr. Anirudh has also published a similar case of macular hole. Uh, and Dr. Cyrus has also published along with him uh, a similar case where, because it's, it's to do with the light also. And it's a combination of both sometimes. So the light source uh, has uh, a variable uh, uh, spectrum of light, which extends from around uh, 450 to 700. But if, because, uh, and it also depends on the intensity. Sometimes we use 60%, 80% because the illumination is not adequate for us for multiple reasons. Probably the duration is more or the cornea becomes hazy, edematous or post means a combined surgery where we see 
a little corneal haze or a stromal haze. So all those things also matter. So try to finish surgery as early as possible, but yes, as safely. But as you can see, postoperatively there are no surgical complications. But this are this is a combination because of which a deadly combination probably the dietoxicity plus uh, uh, a light toxicity which has occurred. So. Again, light toxicity. Also, they have uh, have uh, studies where uh, they have shown that okay, uh, the light can be uh, utilized. But again, it's it's for various uh, because the light source and the uh, how the, so there are multiple factors within it. How close you are going to the macula and how far you are. So in which they have identified that around three or four millimeters of distance from the macula means they have just uh, randomly done and then they have used petri dishes. Not in human eyes, so difficult, difficult to directly correlate with the eye part of it. But decreasing the surgical time and uh, there, are, uh, as as I was discussing, it's a combination of all. Probably uh, uh, dye plus uh, a phototoxicity in this case. Okay, thank you for uh, sharing those points, Dr. Bhavik. Would you like to discuss or uh, stress upon uh, the phototoxicity part? Uh, any more points you can add yeah thank you ashish and thank you dr divyansh for uh, uh, commenting uh, those points uh, so we have to understand that light toxicity occurs through two mechanisms one is the photothermal damage and second is a photochemical damage so not going into those details people can read about it is the risk of phototoxicity basically increases with longer exposure time other important point here would be that the maculopathy which is uh, due to light or phototoxicity is evident much early uh, after the surgery. Like in this case also, at the two-week visit itself, uh, the changes were, were noted. Uh, as per the author, uh, the first uh, or the presenter, the first week it was not possible because of the gas field which was there. So that is one aspect. Maybe Chahavir can uh, also speak on this point. Uh, second is uh, about what Dr. Devyansh mentioned is the cumulative toxicity of the dye and the gas and the photo and the light can be a factor as well, as uh, mentioned in the Narayanitra publication by Ramesh Venkatesh et al., where they speak about BBJ having a dual spectrum of absorption, the peak between 200 and 250 and the second peak, which comes later. So, and uh, the xenon flashlight, xenon light, which is there, which is above 400 nanometers, the cumulative effect of the absorption of the dye and the light toxicity can also be a factor. However, that was a case of macular hole where there was an access of the dye to the subretinal space, and here we are th talking about an ERM. So only this is the only factor there. Okay, and uh, uh, what uh, would you peel uh, IL ILM plus uh, ERM, or you would uh, simply peel uh, ERM in such cases? Yeah. So again, that's a very good question and a very debatable topic as well. So earlier, before uh, a few years ago, I should think that doing ILM peeling is good for for everyone the patients and the outcome wise and all which i'm reading now and understanding that it is not true all all the time uh, peeling ilm has its own risk factors own this advantages and disadvantages so what happens is once you peel the ilm of course the recurrence rate is low with the erm which happens in general the erm the recurrence rate in the literature is around 1 to 16 percent uh, however, not all recurrences are clinically significant or visually significant. That also has to be understood. Whereas uh, peeling the ILM per se, it has its own side effects like swelling of the arc arcuate nerve, nerve fiber layer, which is described, or uh, DONFL, that is dissociated optic nerve fiber layer. So they may not be visually uh, having visual symptoms, but the risk of toxicity and damage to the RP with ILM peeling is much more compared to uh, just ERM removal. So what uh, some uh, publications, a good meta-analysis meta described is that peeling of ILM can be reserved for stage three and stage four ERMs. Whereas if you have a very uh, grade one or two ERM, you can just go ahead with a simple ERM peeling and not disturbing the ILM. Okay. And uh, what would be the role of uh, using intravitreal steroids in the case of ERM? Uh, what would be the indication? Uh, so again, uh, I would think that for an idiopathic ERM or a primary ERM, uh, I do not use, I have not used, and I have not come across uh, usage of e steroids per se for ERM. But definitely there is a role in secondary ERMs if it's an inflammatory cause. So 
uh, maybe the other panelists can add in their valuable uh, opinion on that as well. As Parikh said, for primary ERM, I won't use any steroids. For secondary ERM, maybe uh, if the patient has a secondary to BRBO or if it's a secondary to any UAT case, if I'm doing a vitrectomy vit with ERM pill for, for retinal vasculitis, that time we, uh, we use IVTA 1 milligram or 2 milligram after the surgery. Just a question to the panelists that uh, have we observed, uh, okay, do, we do not talk about grade 4, at least. Beyond grade two, have we observed that post-surgery the central macular thickness has increased, or there is some a retinal thickening which is persisting for three months, four months, six months, and sometime a year also? Have any of the panelists observed that? Because then, then I would answer my comments. Yeah, on so this is a very valid point. Actually, I forgot to mention that this is one of the complications of ILM peeling as well. So the authors uh, noted that. Uh, there's a higher chance of post-surgical cystic macular edema if you peel the ILM versus only an ERM peeling. I mean, this was uh, one of the subset of the meta-analysis. Uh, that is the first point. The second point here is that, yes, we do have observed increased thickness. Uh, that is the reason why it is important to counsel the patients that doing a ERM surgery and expecting visual gains at one week or one month is not possible. It's not feasible as well because the retinal architecture may come back to normalcy even after three months, six months. It may take up to a year as well. So there are there are studies uh, uh, which I think it was published in Nigeria recently about a subsequent uh, use of uh, dexamethasone or even IVT along with ARM removal to prevent the yeah. thickening uh, from happening. Sometimes we use periocular steroids like a posture subtenance uh, steroid also following the surgery. And when you see after two months still the thickening is there, I give periocular steroids also. So to, it may, if the inflammatory component is there, that will help to decrease the thickness of the retina. So one more thing to add. So because whatever we are discussing is still not uh, three and four grade uh, ERM. Because in three and four uh, grade ERM, uh, we would see certain times intraretinal fluid. So that is more traction associated uh, uh, things. But uh, in in my scenario. I would think it little otherwise. If for me the grade of ERM is more than grade two, and if it's anything in grade three and four, I would want to add a steroid or a periocular steroid to it because in 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 my series which I have been doing and I am following it up the ERMs. Uh, so the central retinal thickness doesn't come down to near normal. Also, actually, it worsens uh, initially first three months and then later probably around six months or eight months later then you start st seeing the stabilization of the retina so uh, in most of my cases i have added steroids uh, to help overcome uh, this this gross finding which i've seen but as we are discussing not in grade one and two more uh, uh, means not in grade one but at least two three and four obviously i would prefer Uh, this one more thing which I would like to add, when I was looking through the autofluorescence, there is small area over the, uh, like foveal, around the foveal area, where we could see the hyperfluorescence and the hyperfluorescence stippled appearance was not there. I don't know, but probably it might be due to macular pigment optical, like uh, increased density or something. But this is something, again, the case or the paper which uh, Dr. Bhavik was referring to, I guess this has something to do with the pigments or something, pigment density. Hello, so um, there is a question. Uh, any of the panelists can take this. Dr. Uh, Swarnema uh, Saxena has asked, will peeling earlier in a patient with the vision of 6'9 or 6'6 affect the visual outcome as compared to peeling at a later stage? Uh, okay, I probably would answer this. So, uh, yes, uh, for me, 6'12 is not the cutoff. For me, 6'9 is a cutoff, but yes, we need to be very careful because in ERM cases, we see that there are cases where we have landed up into peripheral retinal tears or breaks, but yes, putting air or gas and that itself has subsided. But counseling is very important. When you're operating a case of 6-6, counseling is very important. But yes, I would try to get the surgery done by 6-9 and not beyond that because yes, the reversal from 6-9 onwards is much less has been proven in many of studies, but six, six parts, I would still think I would keep observing the patient with OCT 
or probably uh, MFE ERG, or if you have a option of uh, uh, probably microperimetry, then that would help us give an answer. But yes, uh, keep following it up closely till six six parts, and six nine would be my cutoff actually. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'd like to add here that it is important to understand that what is the patient's problem at 6-6 six, six or even 6-9. Just the vision is not an important criteria. What is the patient's work profile? What is the job? If he's a surgeon and he is going to operate on finer things, he needs to find the vision, near vision. If he is a person, a mechanic, a mechanical uh, like a part uh, who deals with very finer prints and finer uh, instruments and all. So definitely such person would be given a priority and his uh, problems will be uh, answered and all. And they will also benefit out of it. But as Devyansh mentioned, counseling is important. And uh, yeah, what is I want to say? So I want to add one more thing that you can have a spontaneous separation of ERM and where the foveal contour may come down to near exactly normal and then by itself the vision would improve. So I have uh, two of my patients where I have followed up them probably till one year and then I could see that the ERM has separated and by itself the vision has improved. So most importantly, the counseling and follow-up, imaging and to prove as, as Dr. Bhavik was also telling that what exactly patient needs. So because it's not that you operate 6-6 six, six parts and you would give 6-6. Six, six. So we know that there can be multiple hips parts which can arise. So counseling and then following it up closely and if it shows worsening, either structurally or probably drop in near vision because even before the distance vision is affected, the near vision is first affected. So Amsler's chart and MFERG and microperimetry would be helpful for taking the decision. For there is a question for uh, Dr. Chavi. Dr. Bhushan has asked uh, as to how adherent was the ERM uh, intraoperatively? Was there difficulty while peeling? Uh, not really. Like... Uh... Uh, once the feeling was initiated or the flap was lifted, I could feel it quite easily. And so it you, was a stage 4 ERM. Okay. Could you describe the extent of the ERM peel? Yeah, the same which uh, autofluorescence of area. Okay. The whole, yeah, the ERM was quite thick and it was globally adhered. Dr. Divyansh, uh, would you like to give any surgical tips uh, or pearls to manage an uh, ERM case? So, uh, difficult, it's, it's such a vast topic, I don't know. Well, just few pointers. So, see, for a, uh, for a budding surgeon, I think uh, the most important thing would be to initiate the peel. So there are, there are many devices where you can use them, diamond tested forceps or probably uh, uh, Tano or the, the most recent one, the Finesse. So those help you give the first initiation. So yes, if the initiation is correct and if the plane is correct, the other complications of touch, tear and NFL layer would be much less. But yes, I would advise that Keep means not in all cases you keep doing ER and peeling, but in cases where it's indicated, try to keep a focus that not to touch as much as possible the retina and peel where it is required and and use forceps. So, so at, at our institute, we just use a normal Indian forceps. We do not use even the, the, the Grish Eber ones and the more specialized ones for our own reasons. But yes, you can use the more specialized one and which has more better grass for ILM and things like that. Visualization. So the first and foremost thing to start is the visualization. So first, if you're starting a case of ERM, once you're seated and then you've finished the PVD, you're stained, once you have removed the stain, then would be the time where you defocus and then focus it exactly where you want. For us, we still peel under biome. So as you could see in my surgery, so we, it's, it's how we are taught, but if you're having any difficulties, you can use contact systems because the the, the, the depth perception and the, con, uh, the contrast and the clarity is much better, but everything comes with ifs, buts along with it, contacts and non-contact. The option is individual, but 
focusing so once you are clear absolute focus then only start feeling because if there is any poor focus you may either touch some places or probably you may land up into other complication breaks paramacular holes or deep touch and then things like that in this case where uh, it's a stage 4 erm ideally it would be that first initially we try to identify it would be like a secondary membrane as if you can see the oct if if dr chavi can show the oct of this patient the o, it, it's like a secondary membrane which is extending beyond the primary membrane as you can see in the uh, this would be the side in the papillomacular bundle and this would be on the temporal side as you can see it's it's in multiple layers so start from the point where you see the most thickened area and then you can use your forceps or probably we use needle you can use a bent needle also so you need to like tackle this as a secondary membrane it's it's not like a plain erm case so there there may be multiple as you can see uh, the segregation of the ilm uh, over here and some areas multiple layers of uh, Uh, glyotic tissue which is there in the preretinal space so we have to identify exact space and then peel towards the fovea and and in, in this case uh, i would say very well managed because there is no foveal or macular hole because at this case we can see the erm would be most densely adherent at the fovea so in certain points we need to just trim it and leave uh, the parafoveal area uh, with a cutter or with a scissors and then leave it and beyond this because as you can see once we are peeling this kind of erm which is stage 4 obviously the ilm would have peeled but again the re staining is very important because if we are missing on to some membrane which is still present in such cases yes the progression would be faster so if send buts of again peeling ilm is different but yes if you have planned then plan do it completely and one more small tip is that once we are peeling you can initiate at one area and then again repeal so what happens is that gives an correct contrast and in certain cases it goes below the ilm or in between the ilm and retinal interface and you can see the staining is much better so i'm not discussing that once you peel and reconfirmation of the ilm but once you initiate it again peel then you would be able to see the contrast much better so this would be probably for me yeah uh, can i add just one more point hello yeah yeah please sure sure yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, especially in secondary erms like uh, most of the times we can assess with this primary or secondary but for certain occasions we uh, tend to overlook or whatever we just see an erm try to operate uh, there can be a component of vitreoschisis which might be present so uh, you have to make sure that when you try to peel off and you feel okay some tissue has come off and then you uh, you should not be satisfied okay this is this the erm or not definitely restain or you can if you have a suspicion always use a uh, tricot as well intraoperatively to understand is there a component of vitreoschisis or not because uh, that will leave your surgery incomplete and uh, other one more tip is the perception is very extremely important so make sure that you are focused at the area of, as dr divyansh mentioned and another key is to understand the vessels whether where the vessel is disappearing suddenly the vessel is dis disappearing so that is an area where the erm uh, can be initiated the peel can be initiated because you have an idea a rough idea about okay this is the vessel which was gone and this is where the membrane is there so in the temporal periphery to start off with this was one extra point i felt would be helpful to budding surgeons so there is one uh, question i'll take this up dr pratik gandhi had asked which dye was used so ocu blue dye was used from oro lab and uh, so i would just summarize the points so we should uh, avoid uh, multiple times staining with the dye uh, to avoid uh, drug toxicity avoid direct endo illumination uh, exposure to the macula avoid being uh, too close to the macula and uh, concentration of more than 0.5% of the dye an exposure of more than 3 minutes should be avoided shake the vial well before using use a soft tip to inject use a 1 cc syringe rather than a 2 cc syringe and uh, the surgery duration is also important uh, try to minimize the surgical duration and the phototoxicity would also depend on the type of endo illumination used and the intensity of the light which is kept so i uh, thank everyone for uh, 
coming and attending this uh, webinar. And I think we are uh, short on time. Hello, any uh, closing remarks? Yeah, should I say uh, this is? Uh, yeah, Dr. So, Avnish, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, all the panelists, the speakers, and the moderator. Uh, I think uh, I would like to thank the uh, the, the, the what do you call our uh, uh, viewers who are actually there in, in each, even after the initial glitches we had. One thing which I want to mention is that we would be having uh, uh, again invitation for our the next episodes, and we would try to be a bit more vigilant about uh, the next Zoom meeting. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you.